welcome to another episode or edition, depending on your preference, of DeSoto In Depth, the uh, program which allows us to take an interesting subject or, in some cases, a potentially life saving subject and discuss it a little more in depth. And if I ever had to talk about being prepared for severe weather season, I can't think of two more qualified or articulate people on the subject. Uh, we have to my left, um, or in your right at home, uh, the emergency or the regional emergency management coordinator, Lauren Sanchez. Lauren is responsible for coordinating operations and emergency management response for four cities, DeSoto, of course, being the most critical uh, of the four cities. Uh, and we have the, the fire chief, the uh, fire chief for DeSoto Fire Rescue, Brian Southerd. Brian, you've been with us already since the, you're already the veteran fire chief, according as this show is concerned. Absolutely. I want to thank you both and welcome you to DeSoto in depth today. And uh, looking at the severe weather season, in Texas, North Texas, as someone who's not a, a initially a native of this area, wow, it's it's a whole education. It could it, it says uh, we're talking what uh, March through May, but really it could be any time. Mm -hmm. uh, who wants to get it started as to when it is and what are the threats? So I can jump in. So. If anyone has been in North Texas for any amount of time, if you've lived here all your life or just recently moved, um, you know that we get hit with all kinds of hazards. And interestingly enough, I know we were talking earlier that you moved here thinking you were getting away from some of the hazards that you had where you lived before. Uh, but North Texas is actually one of the most disaster prone areas of the whole United States. But no one tells you that. No one tells you that. There. It's not in the brochure when you're looking at all the amazing things in Texas. And Texas is still amazing, and that's why we have shows like this, so we can help educate you ahead of time so that when the next storm comes, because there will be more, right now we're smack dab in the middle of severe weather season. But like we just alluded to, it doesn't just end in May, unfortunately. I wish it did, because I'd get more sleep um, after May. But it really goes through the whole year, and we've seen a lot more activity in the fall and in the winter months. So it's going to be around for a while. As far as severe weather for the spring, our big ones are um, severe weather warnings. And so in that, we have strong damaging winds, large hail, uh, and then we also have tornadoes, right? So that's our biggest threat that we're scared of. We have seen those often in the storms we've had so far this year. Everybody knock on wood at home, too that we don't have more, um, but we've seen an uptick of multiple tornadoes in the storms that we've seen roll through. Now, are we starting, I'm detecting a little bit of a pattern that while DeSoto and the area south of us have a threat a little further north of Dallas, maybe closer to the border with Oklahoma, that's, that's what they call Tornado Alley, isn't it? It is. So the Red River area is right there where Dallas meets Oklahoma, and you're right, they've been getting a lot of these storms. If you look at the radar at the next storm, if we're not getting any weather at the moment, scroll up a little bit and you'll see a nice storm hitting that area. We've had, uh, and I handle a lot of the social media weather updates for DeSoto, and I've seen it go throughout the region. You could be, the whole state of Texas, the whole region could be under a watch, which strictly has one meeting, but warnings are generally very specific. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about the difference and how it makes uh, a difference and how you prepare? And then after Lauren, uh, Brian, if you could jump in after that and talk about what happens. Uh, I, I should add that in addition to putting out fires and handling uh, related emergencies, our emergency coordinator, uh, our, what is the title, the chief emergency coordinator or ma emergency management emergency person management. is our fire chief. So, yeah. so, Lauren, what's the difference between a warning and a watch? Very good question. So, a watch happens typically before an event. So, the National Weather Service will come out and issue a watch if they think conditions could be right in the, in the future, usually that day of, of something happening. So, the way I like to remember it is watch out for it, right? You can still go about your day-to-day. -day, you can still go to the grocery store, uh, but just watch the radar, watch the news, like pay extra Robert attention, De Niro. watch, yeah, watch it all, um, download the app on your phone, right, watch it, keep the news on, watch it, watch the conditions outside, so 
let's say, tornado watch, for example. We saw in this last storm that much of the state, like we just talked about, was in a watch. So people can still go do things, but maybe you don't have an outside picnic, or maybe you're not going to the park for five hours that day, because if conditions change, which they can change very quickly, you don't want to be outside caught in that. So watch just means watch out for it. Once it turns into a warning, that means that it's happening at the moment or it's about to happen based on what the National Weather Service is seeing on the radar. So when a warning is issued, you need to take immediate action. And that's why that one is more localized, right? So the watch can cover the state, but in one area, we'll say DeSoto, again, knock on wood. If a warning was issued here, that means DeSoto is about to get hit with whatever they're warning you about. So that could be a tornado warning, severe thunderstorm warning, hail warning, high wind warning, right? it'll tell you what the warning is for. And then you need to go inside, get out of the area. That sounds good. And I should also say a watch doesn't mean go to the store, buy up all the drinking water, all the toilet paper, and all the paper napkins. Correct. Yeah. We learned a lot of things from the 2021 winter storm, but that was one of the things that we learned. You don't need to go buy everything. It'll still be there. And especially not for a watch. A watch isn't going to last a really long time. Typically, it's a couple hours, maybe a day. Um, and then it expires if nothing happens. And no need to be alarmed, just keep your eyes open. Yep, just watch. Chief Ryan, how does the uh, different, the pending bad weather affect the DeSoto Fire Rescue Department and your shifts or your concerns? Uh, it doesn't affect us from the standpoint that we're ready uh, for these storms. We, we train and get prepared for these storms just like we're training the community. Uh, to get prepared on what to do in the event that these storms help. It is uh, the city uh, management luckily sees the importance of emergency management and they've allowed us to hire someone like Lauren. You know, we really rely on her and her expertise in this area to help keep uh, the citizens prepared. And then that allows the fire department to keep our personnel prepared to respond in the event that the, uh, the, something bad does happen. And I do want to add the the main location of DeSoto Fire Rescue is our newest firehouse. Is that firehouse DOS? Or, okay. So it's designed to take a direct hit from a force something tornado. It's our main community. We have our emergency communication center nearby, but it becomes a command center where we do our operations. Uh, and, uh, Lauren, you've been there. Uh, how does this... Is this a regional command center? Do we, do we ever get any uh, fire departments or emergency responders from other cities who come to us just because of the newness? At the moment, it's not. So each of the four cities, at least in my area, uh, everyone has their own emergency operations center. So that's where city employees, command staff, directors would go to coordinate a response if we had a large event. So currently the new fire station, too, has the City of DeSoto Emergency Operations Center inside. And that's the hardened room that if the weather was as bad as it could be outside, that room would still be standing so that we could still coordinate the response. So currently just DeSoto trains in there. We do exercises. If something happened tonight, that's where we would go to run the um, event coordination. But we are in the process of doing regional training so that if we had a large regional event, everyone could co-locate to one location. And so the DeSoto EOC Emergency Operations Center um, is probably at the top of that list because it's new, it's larger, uh, but the plan is to train to use that one, but also the other four cities. So and depending on where the event was, we can move. And for those who haven't filled in the blanks on the four cities, uh, aside from DeSoto, Cedar Hill, Duncanville, and Lancaster. Correct. And you are based in Duncanville. But That's where I have an office, but yeah, office. work for all four. But you, you go from city to city. Mm -hmm. Correct. And we have a lot of meetings here in DeSoto. We do. I'm in DeSoto very often. <laughs> so, uh, Chief, in terms of uh, the response that your department does, uh, when there's, uh, I mean, we could get into this later when we talk about the co-ed, but what would you do uh, after a storm? How, how would that affect the firefighting duties? Uh, so just like uh, we share Lauren between the four cities, uh, we also share resources between the four cities when it comes to uh, emergency response uh, through the fire departments. So in the event of something major, a major event happening, we're able to pull, let's say, again, let's knock on wood, hope it doesn't happen, let's say it happens in DeSoto, we're able to pull Cedar Hill, Duncanville, and Lancaster in, and then Outside that, we even have a larger footprint within the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex where we can pull in other fire departments to help 
respond so that because when you have a large scale event it obviously takes a lot of firefighters not only to handle that event but other emergencies still continue to happen and we have to be able to respond to those as well and sometimes one fire department will cover from for another uh, if they're close by and they know that you or one of the other three cities or even Dallas is tied up with something big so the key to staying safe is being aware in advance so what we've done is, is put aside a section of the show uh, to talk about how you can get that, that warning in advance. You keep hearing uh, during the storm, National Weather Service. I have to say, they are the most accurate and they seem to be the ones that the forecasts, especially in an emergency situation, are based on. Uh, are they part of the notification network that you respond to as a regional coordinator? And uh, Brian, do you tune to them frequently? Uh, yes, uh, well, and, and I know Lauren can speak to this as well, but uh, one of the things that we do when storms come in, besides the fact that we have group messaging going back, is we, if, if we know a storm's coming in at some time in the middle of the night, we're going to be up monitoring the National Weather Service and the different uh, local uh, news channels to, to make sure we're watching to see what happens as the storm's rolling. Mm -hmm. Unless the Cowboys are playing. Unless the Cowboys are playing. Right. <laughs> yeah. Then, then, they we, just then we put, put the news in the little picture <laughs> in the picture so we can see the Cowboys on the big screen. That's funny. The National Weather Service has a program that as emergency managers and fire chiefs and those that are responsible for weather monitoring have access to. So we have direct communication with them. So when they tell us that they're about to issue a tornado warning, for example, that impacts DeSoto, we see it right before the alert goes out, right before it goes on the news, so we have time to text each other and make a quick phone call, so we're ready to activate the sirens as soon as that alert gets dropped. Whenever there is bad weather in the offing, a bad moon rising, we tend to get emails from Lauren, who's passing on National Weather Service briefing material from a meeting that usually has just concluded or is happening simultaneously. Uh, and that's actually much more detailed than when you would find if you go to the Facebook page for National Weather. Uh, I'll give you a, a hint here. If you really want to follow National Weather Service, Twitter seems to be the best place to get their breaking news. And as a storm shifts through a region, it will issue all the individual warnings. Uh, let's say there's something going out near Waxahachie or Midlothian, and maybe it's moving north, you'll be able to follow the progression with that. Mm -hmm. uh, I will yeah. say, too, that the email that you mentioned that I send out has a lot of information on timing, where they think it's going to hit, what time they think it's going to hit, what the, um, the, sorry, what am I trying to say, the hazards that are going to be present and what the probability is of that. That information they actually post directly on their website. Um, they put it on Facebook. But Facebook, you're limited to how much you can put because people aren't going to sit there and read um, forever. But if you're interested, you can go to the National Weather Service website. And those briefings, as soon as they send it out um, to us, it's posted on their website so that the public can also go get the same information. The uh, city of DeSoto has an affiliation uh, with the Code Red Service. It's a great service. It could be annoying during uh, dangerous weather if you don't like having warnings and alerts, but it's pretty effective. Uh, we have it. Uh, we'll have show you on the screen. It's, it's pretty simple. You could just go to Google and put down Code Red DeSoto or Code Red, and it will ask you your city, and you could register for it. You can get alerts via text, email, a phone call. Uh, I'll, 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 this will be a jump ball to both of you talking about the Code Red service. Uh, when do we get it? What triggers it? And what could we, uh, what could we do with the time jump it gives us on storm response? So if there's any homework I can give anyone watching this is to go sign up for the Code Red system if you haven't already. So like you talked about, when you go sign up, you get to choose exactly how you get your alerts. Text, email, and or phone call. You can do any combination. You also get to go through and it lists the hazards, so you can choose what type of alerts you want to receive. Uh, the alerts come directly from the National Weather Service. So we talked about they're the first ones that know what's coming because they're watching the radars and putting all that information out. So as soon as they issue any type of alert, whoever has signed up for our Code Red system or any similar system in nearby cities, you're going to get that alert as soon as we do. So that will give you time to respond. Uh, which is really important in the middle of the night. Storms love to come through, and if you weren't watching it earlier on the news and you happen to fall asleep and a tornado warning gets issued, 
Your phone's going to go off, wake you up, you'll see it, you'll have time to grab your family and go shelter. So definitely go sign up for and Code Red. You, and uh, you should know where uh, to shelter, and we're going to get into that in a little bit. Uh, Chief Ryan, uh, what Lauren says is correct. It's kind of like I think of it as the national news, and sometimes there's local drop-ins. I know that sometimes DeSoto Fire Rescue or DeSoto Police, depending on who has access to it in the type of emergency, have used Code Red in the past for a more localized warning. Uh, can you give us an example of when you might do that? Uh, absolutely. Uh, so typically that runs right now through the fire department. Uh, when uh, let's, let's use the police department. If they need us to send out a Code Red alert, uh, for we do it for missing people uh, quite often when we're doing a, a large-scale search trying to find someone. They will, they will reach out to us, and we can send out Code Red messages uh, as well for uh, local stuff that's happening within just within our region or something that we need to alert people on. Yeah, there's a couple occasions I remember where you have a, an elderly person uh, who may or may not have signs of dementia and they wander off, and, and that's a real good service for putting things out there, and we'll augment it with what we have online. Right. So it's not only dangerous weather that we that's use right. the service we can, for. We can use it for anything. Correct. So we are also talking about uh, other forms of alert. Before I get into the weather radio, and I actually brought mine with me, it's, it's show and tell today, but these things are very effective, is that a lot of your favorite television stations now have apps. Um, I have CBS 11 and NBC 5. I have them on my phone. I know there's a ABC, uh, WFAA, they think they call it a WAP, weather app. Uh, and I think that the one I received from CBS 11 and NBC 5 are the same provider because there's been times it's been totally dark and quiet in my room and all of a sudden you'll hear a uh, robotic man's voice. Lightning has been detected in your immediate area or a tornado warning has been uh, triggered in your area. And sometimes I'll get those before I get a code red or whatnot because those seem to be tied into your immediate area. Um, do you find the private, uh, not the private sector, but local news is getting more into the alert business and uh, their accuracy is pretty good? They are. So that program I mentioned that emergency managers use with the National Weather Service, the news media is also on that same program. So the news is getting it at the exact same time that we're getting it at the city level as soon as the National Weather Service puts it out. Okay, now weather radios. It sounds like a geeky thing, but it actually could save your life. Mm -hmm. And if you learn how to work it better than I do, you could specify the region where you get the warning because in an emergency situation, you'll get a flashing strobe light on this, a loud like air raid warning mm -hmm. a a a type sound, uh, and it'll be very loud. And when you turn it down, then you will get the the ongoing messaging, which you can get from NOAA, uh, National Ocean and something, I don't know what it is, but it's tied to the National Weather Service, mm -hmm. and they'll give you the ongoing, like, uh, 8.55 p.m., uh, tornado warning has been issued for your location. Seek shelter immediately, uh, and it'll go on for a while, but the good thing about these is, uh, at least most of them, they have, like, a solar panel, so you the battery gets charged, and if the battery is discharged, there's actually a little crank on this thing, which you can pull out, but unless you're doing an actual broadcast show, then it's, <laughs> and you could you can charge do it. it to charge it yourself. You, you also probably increase your heartbeat because you're already <laughs> in an emergency mode and uh, should have a defibrillator built into it. Uh, but these are, these are good things to have, and uh, I know that some emergency management entities, not here, I've, I've seen them make them available, but you can get these online, you can get them many other places, but there's a good incentive right now to go out and get one of these uh, through this weekend. We were talking about that earlier, so when I say what is that, yeah. uh, what is that? Very true. So you can get those online, you can also get those at most uh, hardware stores, so locally you can find them. This weekend is a great weekend to get weather radios and other emergency supplies because it is tax-free weekend in Texas. So April 23rd through the 25th, we were just looking at a list of things that are eligible. You can get portable generators under $3,000, fuel cans, batteries, weather radios, 
Um, ice chests and coolers were also included in there in case the power went out and you had to store food. So this is a good time to go get your ice chests and, and, and coolers before and the summer Ryan, starts. That's food. <laughs> you don't need food to store beverages in there. Or water, right? Okay. Put water in there in case... Uh, in case the power goes out and water freezes, then you have your cooler. Uh, but if you go, I was on the Comptroller of Texas website right before this, and they have a nice, easy-to-read list of all the things that are eligible. So if you're free this weekend uh, and need some supplies, it's a good time to make a list and go buy them. And uh, we were talking about some of the supplies that you could use it for, and just uh, this might be reiterating what you said. Uh, Chief Ryan, you had said, oh, it's a great opportunity to get the following. What would you be looking to get? Uh, with the tax advantage this weekend? Uh, well, I'm going to look at some gas cans because I do have two generators at my house, and so I'm, I'm personally going to get some, some fuel cans. That way I can have extra fuel on board in the event that we do lose power for an extended period of time. I can fill my generators up and, and keep the essentials powered at my house. If you want to know which weather radio to get, uh, there's various recommendations online. We put three links on our screen. I realize you can't link it because it's a PDF, but uh, you could Google these. Uh, Weather.gov has some recommendations, and they're the least biased of the group because mm -hmm. uh, they're basically, I think they're linked to the National Weather Service, or at least partially. Um, but popular mechanics, if you have to talk about something to function in an emergency, can't get better than popular mechanics. And for some reason, Southern Living the place that bought you bourbon, pecan, pie recipes, and, 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 and great summer fashions also recommends the uh, weather radio. They have a good listing in there. And uh, I guess that's because as beautiful as the south is, mm -hmm. and the weather is very volatile. Mm -hmm. And I think I got this recommendation. This was a brand of Midland just as being recommended by a lot of the outlets. I mean, go by what you see online and what you decide. Uh, you want to have something that's dependable. And my first inkling normally is to save a couple dollars, you know, maybe go with an off-name brand. But when it comes to a weather radio, uh, it's good to have a proven commodity mm -hmm. with you. Yeah. So emergency, outdoor emergency warning sirens, that's a throwback to an earlier time in many ways when people didn't have so many technology options. You have a lot of options to give you an alert long before a siren goes off. However, if you're in your house and you don't hear a siren, you might want to call up and complain, but those aren't really meant for people in their house, are they? No, they're not. So outdoor warning sirens, a lot of people call them tornado sirens, and that's not correct. We try to get away from that because we don't want you to think that they're only activated for tornadoes. So outdoor warning sirens are designed to be set off for various hazards. So tornadoes included, if we have a large hail over an inch and a quarter, if we have damaging sustained winds over 70 miles an hour, uh, but also it could be non-weather related. So if we had a um, this tanker going through the city carrying some kind of chemicals or fuel and there was a spill and we needed people in that area to evacuate or get inside, we could set off sirens for something like that. So if you hear sirens, what you're supposed to do is go indoors and seek additional information, really just to figure out what's going on. And they're designed for people who are outside. We try to make the name uh, make sense, and luckily everyone calls them that. So outdoor warning sirens. If you're outside, hopefully you hear it. That means go inside. Okay. If you're inside your house, you're probably not going to hear it. And that's okay because you're already inside. On uh, Wednesday, April 6th at 2 p.m., Brian Southern personally, well, your department, uh, mm -hmm. went out and sounded the sirens that we have. Um, but we do it on a clear day. Once a month. Once a month. Why do we do it when it's clear out? Because uh, we don't want to confuse uh, everyone. If we were sounding them when it was cloudy out or it looked stormy, uh, then everybody obviously would think something was going on. So on the first Wednesday of every month that is clear out, we will sound the sirens as just a test to make sure everything is functioning as it should uh, in the event we need to use them in a real emergency. Mm -hmm. All of North Texas does it the first Wednesday of the month. The timing varies. Some cities do it at noon, 1 or 2 p.m. So if you wanted to hear it, if you're in DeSoto, you could step outside on that Wednesday at 2 if it's clear to hear what it sounds like. You could also tell your kids, hey, listen for this. If you hear this, here's what you need to do. Uh, but other cities, if you want to hear yours, you can look up online what time they sound if you want to hear what yours sound like.
When you hear one, it sounds like it's moving. Is there a reason for that? Yes, all the sirens that we have in the city rotate. So when it's facing you, it's going to be louder, and then you're going to hear it get a little quieter as it pans away from you, and then it's going to come back, and it's going to be louder, and so they rotate. Every time we activate it, uh, sounds for three minutes, and if the threat is still there, then we'll activate again. And if you want to hear what this uh, exercise or what the actual siren sounds like, you can go to our website. Just put down DeSoto Warning Siren Test, April 6, 2 p.m., because uh, otherwise you might get news stories going back a couple of years uh, when the sirens, didn't, they work too well. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, uh, just trying to get into uh, a couple closing thoughts. When you do hear a siren, when you do hear a warning, when Code Red starts sending you messages and it says, take cover, uh, seeking shelter from the storm is what I call this, where should you go uh, in uh, severe weather season? Where shouldn't you go? You always want to go indoors. So if you're outside, you want to seek shelter in the closest sturdy building that you can. If you're in your car, it's not safe to shelter in your car. You want to park your car and get into a building. If you're driving, same thing. As soon as you can, safely exit the roadway, park and get into a building, do it. Uh, we've seen in movies where people park under bridges. It's not recommended. That's not going to protect you from the wind. And then you're blocking the cars behind you. So if they were trying to safely exit the highway, well, now you're blocking the bridge and everyone's life is in more jeopardy. So park and get inside. Once you're inside, you want to go to the most interior room. So windows are bad. You don't want windows. You want to avoid any walls that touch the outside in case those get impacted by wind or debris and get knocked in. So go as interior as you can. You want to get low to the ground <clears throat> excuse me, and cover your head. Um, make sure you have that spot identified in your house and everybody knows where to go. So in most cases, it's a downstairs bathroom, uh, downstairs closet, some rooms under their staircases have some storage space and that's where everybody goes to shelter. Is it a good idea to keep uh, water or any emergency rations in your emergency room? It would be a great idea. And if you can't, then just have a bag somewhere easily accessible that has water, maybe some first aid. Um, if you have kids, maybe a coloring book or a toy, and you can grab that bag to take in there with you. We had a, a winter storm uh, about two years ago. Uh, Mayor Rachel Proctor was sworn in, and later that week, she was in an emergency mode, and our fire department, uh, that station two, began became a, a command center. And I know that talk started then, and they probably looped you in very early, like, next time this happens, what could we be doing to make things a little better and to maybe ease some of the strain on our people? And I know talk of a community organization's uh, co-ed, uh, community organization's active and, and disaster came up. Could both you, depending on who wants to start first, talk a little bit about that group and who it is and, and what they do? Mm -hmm. Perfect. So the city is a part of what's called a VOAD at the county level, Volunteer Organizations Active in Disaster, and we've been doing that for years. So it's a group that if we were impacted and we needed help from outside the city for, to fill any needs that our residents have, we would reach out to this county group and bring help in. We learned during the winter storm they were extremely busy, but also the roads were frozen and they couldn't, actually, they couldn't drive here. And so we realized that we had a lot of organizations already in the city of DeSoto that provide a lot of resources to the community that could also be provided during an emergency situation. So we got all of those groups together in what we call a COAD. And so you'll see on the screen some of the organizations that are members. The list is even longer than this now because we're adding new ones daily. And so what this is, is this is a group that if something happened tomorrow and we had residents, for example, say that needed uh, sheltering, they need food, Maybe we had some apartment fires and we need new furniture, they need school supplies for their kids, whatever it may be after a disaster. We would reach out to this group with our needs and they have all identified that they would have something to provide to those residents. And so they would come out and just meet with them and give them what they need. And it, it would be a great thing. We've used it a few times, very small scale. We haven't had a big disaster yet, uh, but if we did, I'm confident we're ready. They're ready. And I know that our fire chief was out with a couple of these members not too long ago. I want to say Lions Club and Rotary Club. Um, do you ever get into conversations about co-ed when you're there, or is it more uh, 
on other subjects. Oh, yeah, no, we, we talk about it. Yeah, I'm actually a member of the Lions Club and the Rotary Club, so, yeah, typically when I go to those meetings, we, we end up around this conversation. Yeah, and that's like being a, uh, a, a Cowboys and a Texans fan. That's right. There's people who say you can't <laughs> do both. That's exactly right. That's exactly I decided to go ahead and do both just because I'm a rebel that way. <laughs> Sounds pretty good. Well, we wanted to keep the show uh, short and sweet, and I think we were just at the 30-minute mark. So I want to thank you. Uh, we have an official thank you on our screen now. Uh, Lawrence Sanchez, the Regional Four City Emergency Management Operations Coordinator, uh, and Chief Brian Southern of DeSoto Fire Rescue. Uh, it's going to sound funny, but I sleep a lot better at night knowing you both are on the job. Oh, we appreciate that. Thanks for having us. Well, you us. both have my phone number, so it means... <laughs> You'll be the first wrong, call. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to get that call. Anyway, thanks. This is DeSoto In-Depth, and next week we will be back with another subject that we could talk about in-depth. But for right now, have a good, good day, and be safe.